Arriving from around 11 a.m., the cars and owners were greeted by blue skies and warm temperatures for the arrival on Madeira Drive. One of the first arrivals was this 1938 special. Running through shot now is a 1934-16-6 saloon. Another 1937. This is John Galton Swallow generally acknowledged as the first Jaguar.
The Mayor of Brighton and Hove, Councillor Anne Meadows, was on hand to welcome everyone. Number 101 is a 1929 Chumney. And did you drive the car here? Oh yes, absolutely. You drive it regularly? Yes, yes. Although it has had quite a bit of work done on it recently, it's been rewired and it had the gearbox put in on Friday, Friday night. And we left yesterday, Saturday. So a bit of a test? Just. <laughs> and you had, how long have you had the car and how did it come into your possession? Um, I've had it 19 years. It was advertised in the Austin 7 magazine for sale, so I've had it 19 years. Why an Austin 7? Just something I wanted. I, I used to have a Ruby before this, but I just wanted to have a smaller, slightly older car, and I had, went for the box saloon. So what's the, um, the major problems you've ever had with it? Um, well, the gearbox crunching together wasn't very good because it got, got jammed. Luckily, I was at the bottom of my drive, so um, the whole gearbox had to be rebuilt. And also, about four or five years ago, I had a crankshaft break on me. That was pretty major too. And I noticed that you're actually running a stall here today. What do you do uh, on the stall? Um, I've got uh, various items um, embroidered for the uh, summer anniversary, the 90th anniversary for the Austin 7s, or I think it's the all, all the Austins, and I'm just trying to make a few bob really, and uh, enjoying doing it. I've had it about 10-12 oh, years. Uh, it's a 1938, it's a late 38, because unlike the earlier 38, the, the Austin rubies, it's got a full steel roof, steel suns, sliding sunshine roof. Um, whereas if you look at the other rubies, they've got sort of fabric roofs. Um, various other things, hidden hinge bonnet, and various other refinements. Well, they came in sort of midway through 1938. They're easy to fix, easy to get spares. It's, you know, it's... Uh, and, there's a, and the best thing about it is there's a great crowd of people who've, um, as you've seen down here, lovely people, good club, great fun. I do all the work on this. I didn't restore this one. I've restored another one and I'm restoring an old van at the moment. I've seen seven vans, so it's, uh, it's a disease, really. Once you start, you can't stop.
By midday, Madeira Drive was getting quite full up. Now that's what I call patina.
from Essex, this is a 1933 two-seat Tourer. It's a 1929 uh, TT replica. It's a replica of the car that came third in the 1929 Ulster TT. There was a team of four cars and um, they came third and fourth. There was a handicap race. It was won by Caracciola driving a 7-litre supercharged Mercedes-Benz and Campari in a 1500cc Alfa Romeo came second and Austin Sevens came third, fourth, 16th and 19th. So you obviously coveted this vehicle. <laughs> you obviously coveted one of these vehicles. Well that's right, but there was none left. And so I've um, built a replica. Um, I wasn't the only one involved. There was a chap in Ireland got hold of the original fuel tank from one of them. It was all rusted out. And he wanted one and I wanted one, so we decided to build two replicas. And um, I, he, he collected lots of photographs, and so did I, of the original cars. And I managed to get some chassis drawings. We had the original petrol tank. And from that, I was able to make up um, the scale drawing of the original car. And I could do the side view and the plan view. So then I made a scale model and um, I photographed it from the same um, views, same angles as the, um, of the original cars to make sure I got the contours right. Then scaled it up to full size, made a buck and uh, Roger Yates, a panel beat, a friend of mine, he panel beat the body and I did all the rest of the fittings. It took about five years and um, the original cars were supercharged and I've, I've got a replica supercharger and the bits to make the supercharged engine but at the moment it's got an unsupercharged one in it and it runs quite well with that. The sort of pre-1937 they did about tour touring versions of about 14 horse and the Ruby did 17 and these did about 24 Unsu the unsupercharged was about 24 it's about 36 for the supercharged one. And that equates to what sort of speeds? Well, it's got the uh, it's got a sports unsupercharged sports engine at the moment. It does about 70 miles per hour, but it should do about 80 or a bit more. And so um, back in '94, um, I looked around and quite by accident, one of the Austin Seven chaps in Bromley, where I live, um, had just purchased this car in a very rusty, basic state, and stored it, um, and he allowed me to buy it. So I brought this wreckage home, um, having paid about £1,500 for it, um, which shocked the wife somewhat as this rusty pile of tin appeared outside. Um, it took me about three years to restore, only because uh, the good lady said, if this is going to be a project, it's not going to be one you're going to be finished with in six months. <laughs> so three years later, it was MIT on the road. Since then, I've done about 33,000 miles in it, um, done one Land's End of John of Ropes with my 12 year old grandson many years ago. Uh, it's 2,050 miles in five days. So nothing so ambitious now. I'm 18 next month. Um, and the old limbs don't like being squashed up in the cabin as much as it was. Um, the car is basically a straightforward 1936 uh, open road tourer. They say about one of these is made for every 300 of the Ruby saloons you'll see around the place. So you won't see too many. Um, of these tours. Um, I did all the upholstery myself and, I, and the hood myself. My son-in-law did the painting of it. The engine, it's now in its third rebuilt engine. This particular model, I should explain, I'm not, I'm not getting too technical, um, has shell bearings like a modern car. They fitted them. The replacement of these days are not a success. There seems to be a difficulty in getting the right size. So you end up having to sort of file the ends off the bearing shells before you put them away, which is not a good thing. And I, once a year I would run a big air in, in bearing shell and again my son-in-law then come out with a tow rope had to tow me back. So in 2010 he said, Father we've had enough of this, took the car away and his friend who's a, a professional car restorer and has restored his Aston Martin for him, that sort of thing, took the engine away, started from scratch um, the best crankshaft and all the rest he could do. Um, and a month later, appeared with, all I can say is a mechanical sewing machine. It's absolutely beautiful engine here. Well, I do quietly cover some of the big 10s and the big 12s that pass. 
they're so much more room inside, more comfortable. On the other hand, they cost something like a factor of ten times the cost. Uh, you can't get cheaper motoring of these. When you think about it, there's no tax, historic. That's about 40 of the gallon, which my full focus does. Um, insurance for a comprehensive no mileage limit is 50 pounds a year. So, what is a? How can, you can't get cheaper motoring, man. And you can just get two of us in. <laughs> Looking splendid in British racing green, this is a 1929 special. Yeah. <laughs> 